everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming. There are, it's an interesting event to be having on Election Day, and it seems actually a really wonderful event to be having on Election Day. Um, as usual, I'm Patty Limerick from the San Diego American West. I want to thank our co-sponsors for the Fracking Sense series, the Boulder County Commissioners and staff, and to remind you that Fracking Sense is one part of a big project funded by the National Science Foundation Sustainability Research Network, researching oil and gas development and hydraulic fracturing. And I also, as usual, want to thank the Center of the American West staff. You know who you are. Thank you so much for um, helping me in well, measurable ways, but certainly with these evenings. This is important. Fracking Sense will be on a little vacation, so do not come back until the first Tuesday in December. If you do come, back to this room, and we are not here, those of you who appear should go out for a beer and chat with each other about <laughs> fracking and share your perspectives, because I think you would have a really interesting, it's quite a diverse set of perspectives present in this room. So uh, do, I suppose if you take the receipt from those beverages, I would consider it a Standing American West project, or at least a personal contribution, <laughs> so, so bring that to me. Uh, but next Tuesday, a week from tonight, do not go out for a beer, but where you would ordinarily head off to Frankincense, change your course and go to Benson 180 at 6.30, where we, the South American West will be hosting a tribute to the late, great Western public intellectual, pundit, humorist, contrarian, Ed Quillen. Mm. So, with guests ranging from Ed and Betsy Marston of High Country News fame to noted Colorado writer Laura Pritchett and the astoundingly lively and original and eccentric county commissioner of San Miguel County, Art Good Times. Anyone know Art Good Times? I know. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, um, young people who have. What do you think about that? Should people come here at good times? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. These are, these are connoisseurs of interesting people sitting around the room here. So yes, please come here that. Um, and we will all be reading, I will be doing it too, we will all be reading from our favorite passages from Ed Quillen. So it'll be five minutes each and it should give us, oh, and also uh, Ed's widow, Martha, will be with us and also his daughter, Abby, who's put together this collection of his Work. So that will be, a, I think, a memorable tribute. Tonight we will, as usual, stick to our custom of written questions, uh, probably especially tonight because it seems certain that there will be lots of questions. During the talk, people from the Senate of the American West will walk around the room collecting questions and delivering them to me. I will sort them into categories and present them to the speaker. And thanks to one of our members here who pointed out that it would be, um, well, there she is, a very good suggestion, that we kind of cut off the strolling when the discussion starts, but people will continue strolling, so you will always be able, without having to wave your note, technically you'll be able to uh, get more in there. Um, Congresswoman, we know you have been centrally involved in health care policy, and we have several hundred questions we would like to ask you about that. I can answer all of them. And we also have several thousand questions we would like to ask you about the operations of Congress today. <laughs> But we are going to keep ourselves under control and stay focused on the topic of oil and gas development. So there is, this can be very brief because she is so, known. you are the senior member of Congress in the state of Colorado. She is serving her ninth term in Congress as representative of the first district of Colorado. She is a member of a number of important committees and those will, I think a number of them will come up in her discussion so I won't rehearse all that. You have the program you can look at. Uh, what I want to accent is that I have had the extremely good fortune to know her and to read of her for years and to just think to myself what a ridiculous armchair quarterback I am and how <laughs> having known Diana is just out there in that fray and so remarkable in her equanimity, her patience and good nature, a sense of humor that defies fatigue. <laughs> I have a pretty good sense of humor, but I think mine would not. Uh, mine has not been put to the test, yours has been. So my sense of humor might look a little healthier, but it's just because it's had a, a cruise of a life compared to what you have taken on. She is a fourth generation Coloradan. She graduated from Denver South High School, received her BA from Colorado College and her JD from NYU and then after that came back after the law degree came back and served two terms in the Colorado House of Rep Representatives where she was assistant minority leader from 1993 to 1995. 
She may represent Denver, but she is a very Western sort with a long-running interest in and commitment to the well-being of the public lands and also a long-running interest in energy issues. So it is my privilege to introduce to you Congresswoman Diana DeGette. Thanks so much, Patty. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. And I will tell you that my um, sense of humor was put to the test the last few weeks in Congress, especially when I had to cancel my long-standing trip to Italy with my husband because I got stuck in Washington with the sequester by the Tea Party. And uh, they were lucky they didn't come very close to me during those few days because I might have been in prison right now. So anyway, it's, it's a delight to be here with you today. Um, and it's really a delight to be here as a guest of the, of the Center for American West. I think it's kind of ironic that I am here on election night because, of course, we have this ballot initiative in five local localities here in Colorado around fracking. And uh, my own, my own uh, congressional district, Denver, and then some of the suburban areas south of Denver, um, nobody has yet put a ballot initiative on to ban fracking. But even in, even in my district, we've had um, reports of fracking out near the airport and other areas. So I imagine that'll probably come next. Um, many of you might know that I've been working on the issue of hydraulic fracturing for many years in Congress. Why? Well, I'll talk about it in a minute. But I'm a senior member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And one of the many areas in our jurisdiction, as you heard from Patty, health care is in our jurisdiction, um, internet and telecommunications, consumer protection, national institutes of health, on and on and on. But something else that we talk about in this committee is energy and environment. And so, uh, so I, as a Westerner, I've been looking a lot for many, many years at issues of balancing public lands and energy development. Um, and, and you know, this is never more clear, this dichotomy is never more clear than in a place like Colorado, where we look uh, for historically over the years at the basis of our economic growth and how we've benefited very strongly from a strong energy economy. The, the state's natural gas reserves, um, more so now than ever, offer the promise of new jobs, new energy, and a stronger economy for the long term. I'm sure you've heard from a number of your speakers in this series about uh, what natural gas can do for our energy economy. It's also an integral part of Colorado's clean air, clean jobs economy or initiative. So I understand the importance of natural gas as a bridge fuel as we look at development of an energy strategy that transitions to renewable energy and um, energy savings and so on, but also as a companion to the robust and reliable energy sources that we're trying to develop. But at the same time, that we, and I, I don't really understand why this is a radical view, but some people seem to think it is, is, is I think that the economic benefits of natural gas extraction cannot come at the expense of local communities and the environment. And sometimes I feel like this choice is presented to us as an either or. Either we have natural gas development or we, or, we have, um, or we have economic decay. And so we need to make sure, as we're doing energy exploration and development, as we're looking at jobs, as we're looking at this transitional fuel, that we also make sure that energy exploration, and particularly hydraulic fracturing, is done safely and responsibly. So you all know, because, um, because you're educated, otherwise you'd be home watching I don't know, America's, got, no, um, that's, that's off now, The Voice. You'd be home watching The Voice. Um, so you all know that fracking is a process whereby fluids are injected in, in high pressure into underground rock formations to break them open to extract natural gas. And, um, and you will hear people from the energy 
uh, in industry say to you, well, fracking has been around for decades, which is true. The thing that's new in the past few years is a technological advance that combines fracking with horizontal drilling that allows us to do, to do this horizontal fracking that, that has given us this incredible increase in American fossil fuel production and has enabled us to do fracking in places where they could never drill for natural gas with traditional processes before. And so many people, and I'm sure many people in this room right here tonight, have been, become increasingly alarmed by the fact that the frac fluids contain toxic chemicals and that the exposure to these chemicals, even at low concentrations, can have adverse health and environmental effects. And so therefore, a lot of people have, including myself, have concerns that fracking could contaminate drinking water supplies, both underground and surface water, if we don't have reasonable safeguards to protect public health. And that's why my work in Congress on fracking has uh, concentrated primarily on protecting our um, drinking water. And also, if you think about Colorado and the West, what's our most precious resource here? Water. And so we need to make sure that we're protecting water in general as we look at fracking. I'm also interested, though, as we look at regulation of fracking and what to do, about other concerns that have, much, have had much less attention in many places, such as air, air emissions and land use changes. And so I want to start, um, with your indulgence, at the beginning of the story of my involvement in fracking, going back to 2005 and the Energy Policy Act. And the reason I want to do that is I think we have to hold all of this in context as we look at how fast this has developed in a very short amount of time. In 2005, I was in my fourth term in Congress, and we were working on significant energy legislation called the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Now, um, what this bill did is it created, among other things, the Renewable Fuel Standard for Transportation Fuels, and it had energy subsidies for oil. Remember, this was 2005. George W. Bush was president, and the Republicans controlled both the House and the Senate at that time. And so we had lots of energy subsidies in the Fuel Act, in the Energy Policy Act of 2005 for coal, oil, gas, nuclear, and also some, some, some um, subsidies for renewables and efficiency that are around today. This was a major energy bill, the last energy bill that was passed by the Congress. And, um, and so we had a lot of hearings in my committee. We had a lot of votes to consider this massive bill. But something happened in the House in the dead of night. This is what people always hate, to, the part of Congress people always hate to hear about. It happened in the dead of night. And of course, the other body, the Senate, uh, uh, you know, nothing ever good ever happens there except for when it does. But, but um, uh, after the bill passed the House, then it went over to the Senate, and in the dead of night, there was an amendment added. Um, and it seems incredible, but it, that's exactly how it happened. We all call it the Halliburton loophole. It was very sneaky, and what it did was it gave oil and gas companies a pass on one of our bedrock environmental laws, the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, at that point, and, and, and the Safe Drinking Water Act, as you know, it's been around forever. It's been one of our most successful environmental laws in this country, and it basically requires people who are putting um, chemicals or substances into our drinking water to disclose what's in there. And, um, and, and fracking, or this drilling, is the only activity that is exempted under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And it was exempted in the middle of the night in this Halliburton loophole. Now, in 2005, if you think back to that point, there hadn't been a lot of research into fracking. And a lot of people weren't talking about fracking. Most people, uh, how many people in this room even knew what fracking was back in 2005? Not very, a few of you did. But I'm going to guarantee you my constituents didn't know what it was. And um, uh, in 2004, the EPA, remember this was under the Bush administration, the EPA had completed a survey of the literature on fracking and they determined from that survey that fracking coal bed, met coal bed methane wells posed little to no research to drinking water. 
And so after the EPA re released those res results, which PS, many people say were a study, but they were not. They were not a study, they were a survey of the literature. An EPA whistleblower in Denver approached me with evidence that the EPA had not really investigated the risks to drinking water from fracking. What he said was that the EPA's advisors had ties to the oil and gas industry and were using this report to stop further investigations or regulation on hydraulic fracturing. And so even with this controversy over the EPA's findings, the industry was able to convince whoever mystery senators there were over there in the Senate to amend the Energy Policy Act so that the EPA would only have oversight over hydraulic fracturing if diesel oil was used. And so thus the Halliburton loophole was created. Uh, but you know, the way this loophole was worded is confusing, <coughs> making this even difficult to implement. And eight years later, the White House is still under, under President Obama, is still working to clarify the regulation. But because of the confusing wording, you know, this is what always happened. You want me to talk about the Affordable Care Act next time, but this is what happened with the ACA, too, is when people just stick this stuff in the bill in the middle of the night, they often don't use the most precise language. And so, therefore, it becomes very difficult to enforce it. And so the practical effect of this is for the last eight years, fracking has essentially become completely exempt from the safe drinking Drinking Water Act because of the loophole. And so, um, so after the whistleblower came to me, um, and also some people came to me and gave me anecdotal evidence that workers um, in a hospital in Grand Junction had been injured when a worker who had been working with fracking fluid came in uh, with some injuries, gotten the frac fluid onto a hospital worker, and she almost died, uh, they thought, as a result of the frac fluid. But it's, it's a really odd chicken and egg problem because if you don't have any requirement that the chemicals in frac fluid be reported and disclosed and if somebody's injured, you don't know what is injuring them because they don't have to report what's in the frac fluid. And I'll talk about this in a minute, but that's been the problem. You'll hear the industry say, um, you know, nobody is ever injured by fracking fluid, but we don't know that because they haven't been required to disclose what's in the fracking fluid, so we don't know if people are being injured by it. Now, um, uh, as a result of both the whistleblowers uh, report to me and also this anecdotal evidence. I introduced a really radical bill and I'm just going to tell you about it. I introduced the Fracking Responsibility and Awareness of Chemicals Act or as it's better known the FRAC Act. I did this in 2008. Again, I'm going to guarantee you very few members of Congress knew about hydraulic fracturing or what was going on. Now I've been reintroducing this bill every session of Congress since 2008 and now, what's happened just in these number of years is local, local citizens, property owners, and others have all begun to deal with fracking because fracking is happening all over the country in places from upstate New York to Pennsylvania to Colorado to many, many places where people weren't seeing oil and gas development in the past. And more and more members of Congress are hearing from their constituents that they are very concerned about, uh, about the fact, about this Halliburton loophole and the fact that the chemical components of frac fluid don't have to be disclosed. And so I'm pleased to report that as, as local concern has grown about this practice, Practice. So has the pressure on members of Congress, and so has the interest of, of members of Congress on both sides of the aisle grown. And, um, and this year, for the first time, I got my first Republican co-sponsor of the legislation, said, uh, Representative Chris Gibson, who is a Republican from upstate New York. He came up to me, and he, um, and he said on the floor, and he said, Diana, I read your bill. It's a very elegant bill. All it says, and I'll talk about it in a minute, it says that 
that um, the ke chemical components of fracking have to be reported and disclosed. And he says, so I'm supporting it. And a lot of other Repu Republicans, while they may not be co-sponsoring the bill, they say that they would vote for it if it came to a vote on the floor. So I feel like we're making real progress with this bill. So what exactly does the Frack Act do? The first thing it does is it repeals the Halliburton loophole and it restores regulation of all fracking uh, to under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And there's been a lot of misinformation about what this means. So let me tell you what it means. The first thing is, if fracking was covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act, the EPA would not be reviewing each siting of each well. I hear this a lot from industry, where they say, well, you know, we, we think that, that local and state government should have the authority, not the, not the, uh, not the people in Washington. But, but actually, the way, the way the Safe Drinking Water Act is administered, most states administer the law, and they simply meet the minimum federal standards for Safe Drinking Water Act. And so if fracking was covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act, drillers would not have to do an environmental impact assessment every time they drill. And also, the states would not lose their long-held jurisdiction over oil and gas activities. Now, the Safe Drinking Water Act, as I mentioned, is not one of our nation's most well-known environmental laws. I would argue that's because it's one of the most successful environmental laws on the books. And the reason why it's been so successful is it relies on, co uh, on cooperation between state and federal regulators to keep drinking water safe. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, the EPA protects underground sources of drinking water from contamination, but that protection can happen in a variety of ways. So the EPA sets a general standard of protection for drinking water that applies to everybody. And if you think about it, that makes sense because aquifers don't just stop at state lines, right? I mean, you know, somebody going back and forth between Colorado and Wyoming, they might have water that's going back and forth from Colorado and Wyoming. So what the EPA does is it sets a general standard for drinking water that applies everywhere. So no matter where you live, your drinking water will be safe. Then what happens is states and tribes design and implement programs that meet that standard of protection. And so, for example, the wells that we're drilling in Colorado are very different than the wells that we're drilling, say, in Pennsylvania. The, the geology is different, the, the, the um, depth is different, the chemical components that they use in the frac fluid may well be different, but, but yet, those states would be able to develop under the Safe Drinking Water Act standards for, for their own well development that could meet the standards, the national standards of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so, so um, under the FRAC Act, most states would continue to be the primary regulator of oil and gas activities. They would have primacy over this drinking water and they would work with the EPA, which would set a general standard for protection of underground sources. And so, so, um, so a lot of people have asked me over the years, well, Colorado has good fracking statutes. And I say in general, I think the Colorado regulatory scheme is pretty good. I think it could be stronger, frankly, with the reporting of the chemicals. And I can talk more about frac, frac focus and, and how, they, how they do the reporting of the chemicals. But the responsibility of Congress is not just to represent our own state. That's the representative of the governor and the legislature. Our responsibility is co of Congress is to make sure that the health and welfare of everybody across the country is, is uh, preserved. And so just out of curiosity, for this speech, I had my staff pull the different state statutes and regulations around hydraulic fracturing and what people have to do. I thought <clears throat> I thought I could kind of, you know, give you a synopsis, but I can't because it's pages and pages long. That's what the the that's what the regulations look like if a state even has regulations around disclosure of hydraulic fracturing around the country. There is a patchwork of state laws. Colorado might be one of the best, but there are some that don't have any regulations at all. So I think it's our job as the federal government to set a national standard and that if states want to make stricter standards that will protect their own citizens, 
go for it. But we at least need to have some minimum standard under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so um, that's the first part of the FRAC Act, to let the states and the EPA work together to protect water resources. There's a second part of the FRAC Act. As I had mentioned to you uh, a few minutes ago, there was a nurse in Durango who was injured by the FRAC fluid after the fracking. But um, unfortunately, we never were able to determine what it was that harmed her. And so the second part of the FRAC Act requires the oil and gas industry to be more transparent relating to the chemicals they're using under the public right to know section of the statute. Um, and under, under the bill, um, under the public right to know, if there's an emergency situation, local health and um, fire and other emergency personnel need to know what chemicals are being used in their communities. And so under this bill, the well owner has to disclose the chemical components used in the fracturing, fracking process to regulators and to the public and to post all of this information online. And um, in Wyoming, believe it or not, you know, I never realized I'd be holding up Wyoming as a gold standard, but I am, because um, uh, in Wyoming, they require disclosure of chemicals in frac fluid pre-drilling and post-drilling so that um, if someone is injured, if they get this frac fluid on them, the emergency responders will really know exactly what they're dealing with. And uh, I will say this, uh, under this provision, the operators don't have to disclose the proprietary information. I hear this a lot from the industry too, where people say, well, you don't want us disclosing the proprietary information of the chemicals in the frac fluid. I'm not, I, I'm not making them disclose that. It's just like Coca-Cola. You know, if Coke had to tell us the, they have to tell us the ingredients in the coke, but they don't have to tell us their secret formula. And so it would be the same thing here. But I think that an uh, in a medical emergency, we really need to be able to know what's in that frac fluid. Um, and so, so it would be important because people in Colorado would have the same access to the chemical disclosure information in the same format that people in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, and Texas have. And you know, let, let me talk about this disclosure, and let me talk about frac focus for a minute. Is is um, is is this is a, a, a industry sponsored site where where uh, some of this information has to be disclosed by the companies, and um, and. In Colorado, we make them disclose this. In other states, it's voluntary. But the problem is, with the way this site works, it's well by well. And Colorado has 50,000 active wells. So if you wanted to find out what chemicals were being used in the Colorado wells, and you use frac focus, you would have to look up 50,000 wells. And I don't think that most citizens in Colorado, or even in Boulder County, or Weld County, or wherever else, have the wherewithal to do that. And when we saw, you know, you know the, the cumbersome nature of this was really reflected when we had the terrible floods here in September. Because as the floods ravaged this part of the state, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission reported that they were tracking 13 notable releases of oil, totaling 43,134 gallons. And they were also tracking 17, 000, or 17 releases of produced water. Now, produced water is the fluid that comes back up to the surface after the well is fracked. And it's a combination of water in the reservoir and fracking fluid. So, so when these waters were, when these waters uh, were released as a result of the floods, imagine the cumbersome nature of having to look up all of the different wells in Colorado, figuring out what well it is and then figuring out what chemicals. And that's why we need a more user-friendly and a more universal discovery uh, process. So that's what the FRAC Act is. That's what it does. It's, I think it's a very reasonable, moderate, middle-of-the-road bill. And, um, and so I, I really hope we can pass it. In 2010, we came very close to passing the bill in the House. 
I was um, at the table. I had all of the groups at the table, including the oil and gas industry and the environmental groups. But if you'll recall, 2010 was also an election year. And when the industry realized that the Republicans were going to take over the House, they walked away from the, uh, the oil and gas companies, walked away from the negotiating table. I think they made the wrong choice there. And, the re and I tell them that on a regular basis <laughs> when they come in to meet with me. And, and, and here's why. Because since 2010, there's become so much more awareness of what has happened um, and, and public concern that you see things all around the country like you're seeing in Colorado right here on election day today, which is you see local governments and county governments making their own regulations um, reg regulating fracking, regulating the reporting of the frack fluid. You see, P you see communities banning fracking. You, you see a, a whole plethora of state and local regulations. If you think this is bad, this is the state regulations around disclosure of frack fluid. Imagine if you had the thousands of counties and the thousands of municipalities that have fracking in and around them making their own sets of regulations about disclosure of chemical components. And I've talked to the industry about that. I said, and you, you know, usually uh, in these situations we hear industry saying, we, we hear industry saying, you know, we want, we, we want one federal standard here, right? We don't want the states having all these regulations. In this case, what the industry has said, we want a patchwork of conflicting state regulations. And, 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 and really the states should do this. So we had a hearing, we had a field hearing last year in Denver. And they came and testified about how terrible this was that all of the local and state governments were, or local and state governments and county governments were passing rules and regulations around fracking. And I said to them, well, in that case, will you support one national standard? And they said, well, oh no. And I said, well, in, in that case, I can't help you because uh, local governments are going to do what they feel like they need to do for their citizens in order to protect their citizens' health if you won't even agree to a basic federal standard that says you have to disclose the components of your frac, frac fluid. Because if it's not harmful, if there's nothing wrong with it, as you say, why won't you agree to the disclosure then? And so... Anyway, I've never gotten a very good answer on that. Um, and so, so the way I see this going, <clears throat> we've got 21 states that have disclosure requirements on the books. We have four states with disclosure requirements in development. And I think at some point, the industry is going to say, uncle, and they're going to say, we've got to work with you for a unified federal standard. If that doesn't work, what I'm going to do, the next time we have an, in, uh, an oil and gas bill come through Congress, I'm simply going to attack my bill, attach my bill as an amendment. And I've told them that, too. They know it. And so the next time uh, people want to do some kind of a tax relief for oil and gas or any other kind of energy bill that's germane to this, I'm just going to attach it as an amendment. And I suspect, given the pressure on members of Congress from their constituents on both sides of the aisle, I suspect that it would pass. In the meantime, though, I continue to, to work in my bipartisan way with my colleagues in both houses from both sides of the aisle to try to pass this. So I, I want to talk about um, one last thing and then I really want to go to questions. And the, the last thing I want to talk about is, is why, it, why it is so difficult for us to pass this legislation. And, and I think it's because of this chicken and egg problem that I talked about at the beginning of my speech. Because we don't have required disclosure of these chemical components, we don't have a lot of proof about what the negative effect is, which is why we need to have disclosure. And I think the debate over fracking is really contentious because we just don't have that much peer-reviewed, independent scientific analysis of oil and gas activities. When the Halliburton loophole was passed, as I said, the only study the EPA had done on fracking was this survey of the literature that the whistleblower was telling me about. And so that's why I've been focusing my efforts on common sense proposals that I think that have value. Disclosure is widely embraced 
embrace and the Safe Drinking Water Act has been successful. So now we know, we all know the industry line, which is there's no proven instances of hydraulic fracturing contaminating drinking problem, uh, drinking water. But, but you know, first of all, proven instances is a tricky term as is illustrated by the ongoing testing in Pavilion, Wyoming, where citizens complained about drinking water contamination, proof that everybody will accept is really hard to come by. Simply by the nature of drilling and fracking deep underground, it's difficult to comprehensively prove with technology and measurement tools. And so, so when industry is so invested in this no proven in instances of con contamination, it's likely going to disagree with or discount any findings that we have by citing limitations in measurement and technology. And so, so, um, so we have a lot of scientific issues here. Um, I was able to, to get um, the EPA funding. I think it was how much, $2 million? Or did, I think it was increased beyond $2 million. But several, several years ago, I got, I got money for the EPA to actually do a study. What a, another radical concept, I know. Like I say, we're on the edge all the time over in the 1st Congressional District. And, and um, the study is going to be completed in 2014. It's going to have a landmark, highly rigorous assessment. And um, I, I spoke with Administrator Jackson before she left about this study. She's expanded the study not just to look at the chemical components of the fracking fluid, but also looking at the other issues I talked about at the beginning, the air pollution, the other kinds of pollution impacts that hydraulic fracturing has. Um, and so, so the EPA is going to produce two exhaustive reports on the disposition of shale resources across the country and federal laws and government that may apply to extraction. And then in 2013, this year and 2014, the GAO is going to produce two more reports on it. And so I'm hoping once we get this research, we'll have more information that will help guide us on what our policy should be. Um, so, so anyway, that's kind of what's going on. I, I, um, as I say, I've been working on this issue for a long time, and I've really heard it all. I think it's a fascinating. I, I'm so glad you're having this series of discussions because it really is a fascinating and very nuanced issue, and one that I think we need to apply ourselves to because, because as I said at the beginning, natural gas development can have great impacts for our state as an energy state and also as a transitional fuel. But we, can, we have to make sure if we're going to do this that it's done in an environmentally sound way and in a way that protects our communities. And I think that we need people who are willing to think about this, not just policymakers but citizens as well, who are willing to think about this in a rigorous and scientifically oriented way. And so that's what I'm hoping to do. That's why I'm here tonight. And I'm delighted to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I, I am twice. overwhelmed. I am proud. <laughs> this is a lively group. And I, I, I think my category is actually that's really good. There's a new policy by which you can keep sending in questions the stricture on me to be well organized is yes. now released because they're going to keep coming up and so good. All right, let's go with some of these questions about other, uh, about the jurisdiction and who would be a relationship state, fed, local. Do you think cities and counties should have the right to ban fracking or issue a moratorium on fracking? And you have, of course, spoken of the patchwork issues. So how do you feel about that patchwork? And well, how far I think, the you know, I think, I think it really depends on, on what state you're in and what kind of local control the state constitutions allow. And I know in Colorado we've got lawsuits uh, lawsuits challenging these state regulations with the state. Um, I, I frankly think that if local governments and counties uh, and, and citizens of counties don't feel like they're being adequately protected, then they're going to take matters into their own hands, and that's what you're seeing with these initiatives that are on the ballot right now. I think people, if we had adequate environmental regulation where people really felt like they knew what was going on, they had adequate disclosure, and other environmental controls being put into effect, I, I don't think people would, would, would be so worried about passing, passing local uh, requirements. Do you support a statewide fracking ban? 
No, I do not. But I do support I do support strong environmental regulations. Okay, I read the questions as presented. Uh, and so no, don't worry. I had I, I was telling Patty I had three ACA oh, town hall question. meetings, and we made everybody write their questions out too. So I'm I'm good with this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, what advice do you have for strengthening Governor Hickenlooper's spine on oil and gas issues? I, I'm taking the fifth on that one. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. I, I must say, I've spent time telling the gov governor and his staff that we really need to have, um, and I, you know, and I, I think our, a, a lot of things about our regulatory framework are, are, are trend setting for other states, but, but in, the er in the area I'm working on disclosure, I think that we could have much stronger disclosure requirements in this state, and I have shared that view with them. Okay. Uh, the disclosure of fracking fluid contents is important, but there are serious air and water contamination yes. issues associated with fracking. As you build bipartisan support, could you broaden the Frack Act to address a broader array of threats to air and water? Well, I think, I think that uh, the, the reason the Frack Act is really focused on the Safe Drinking Water Act is because of the Halliburton loophole. It was specifically exempted from that piece of environmental legislation. I actually think that the EPA has the authority under the Clean Air Act and other environmental uh, statutes to, to look at those. And, and um, I haven't met yet with the new EPA administrator, but I'm planning to do that in the next couple of months. And one of the things I want to talk to her about is is um, robust um, uh, examination and enforcement of those laws too. So I guess the answer would be, I'm not gonna expand the FRAC Act to do that because I don't think we need additional uh, legislative authority, but I do think that, that the EPA needs to look at these other uh, serious impacts, potential impacts of fracking, and I'm gonna urge her to do that. I think I am now on the, uh, as I just was. This is the, like, uh, am I answering quickly enough? It is, it's, oh, okay. uh, uh, some people are, okay. uh, melt under this and really. It's okay, said, I'm a trained professional. Break. I see that. <laughs> so holding your own here. So these, I found a little a theme as that last one was about expanding some of your enterprises here. And this is uh, closing federal loopholes. Thank you for being such a leader in Congress on this issue. You have authored the FRAC Act. Are you considering sponsoring any other legislation to close other loopholes, such as cleaner, uh, which would close a loophole in our nation's hazardous waste law. Oh, well, w w you know, my committee has jurisdiction. I, I don't know this cleaner bill, but let I me check it out. I don't know, but that was, it was capitalized. L let me, yes, it's someone's act. Yeah, if we but, actually, but I think but we, do, we break our uh, customs here if I can't, and there's a chance that sometimes I can't read the handwriting. So yeah. uh, would the person who wrote that tell us what the cleaner thing is? Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's um, Cartwright's bill from Pennsylvania. Uh, and it would close the loophole around the uh, nation's hazardous bill. waste law. Um, so Is essentially, hmm? and okay. Yeah. I talked to Jen about this. This is Jen, let, yeah. Jen, stand up. This is Jen Clanahan. I am one of the rare house offices who has two environmental advisors. Jen has spent, many of you know her, she's been around the Colorado community for many, many years. And then Eleanor Bastian, who is my legislative director, also does environmental work. And, and Congressman Cartwright's bill is one of the bills we're looking at. We're also looking at, um, lots of different um, pieces of legislation, including re the long, long, long delayed and much needed reauthorization of TOSCA, which is the Toxic Chemicals Authorization Act, and that's a thorny issue, so we're looking at that too. So there is a lot that we're looking at. Unfortunately, as you might imagine, under the current regulatory and congressional climate in Washington, um, environmental regulation is not one of the top priorities for the current House leadership. You might have sensed that. Thank you. But I will say on Tosca, for example, that's also a bipartisan effort. So there are some things that we can do. First, we're gonna to have to make sure that we don't eliminate the Clean Air Act. That's actually something been discussed. Okay, on the uh, matter again of expanding federal authority yeah. in ways, do you, believe the BLM needs to have regulations for hydraulic fracturing in addition to the states. Yes. Well, you know, the so, so the so the BLM 
uh, has authority over, you know, we, we, have, um, uh, we have the Forest Service lands and the BLM lands, and for all those public lands in Colorado, we also need to have hydraulic fracture regulations. As you might know, several years ago, there were some uh, rules published by the BLM. In my opinion, they were inadequate. They were inadequate for disclosure over frac fluids. But, um, uh, you know, we have actually in Colorado, quite a bit of our oil and gas drilling is on federal lands, on BLM lands. And we need to have, we need to have comparable regulations for that drilling as well. Uh, still in the area of larger federal policies, what can you tell us about relative size of subsidies for fossil fuels versus renewable energy? Oh, I don't have that in my briefing book. Um, off the top of my head, it's... It is it is lopsided, so okay. we need we need to we need to make it more equitable. You know, I, I will tell you, um, everybody. I, we're, finally, they let us come home this week, and <laughs> and I must say, my constituents have been universally quite depressed, and and uh, people around here, I think, are kind of depressed too. But but um, th there are some things that, that I really think that we can we can work on and, and so I'm hoping that that an energy policy is one of them. I will tell you, um, I had an interesting experience last year where um, one of my Republican colleagues from West Virginia came up to me on the House floor. He said, Diana, I think we need to do more things in a bipartisan way. So of course I said, here's my list of bills, you know, would you like to co-sponsor them? But um, he said, well, what I had in mind was a congressional baseball trip. And I, I, I was kind of shocked that he asked me to be his co-sponsor for this, but I went with it. I said, you bet. So we had a um, trip down to Nationals, to the, to the baseball field, and we had about 300 people, Democrats and Republicans, members and staff, at the baseball field, and we got to go, Representative McKinley, we, we went down on the field. I was terrified that there might be a first pitch involved, but fortunately. <laughs> for me there was not and while we were standing I say this anecdote because while we were standing down there on the baseball field I turned to Congressman McKinley and I said you know here's something you can work with me on we have no national energy policy and 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 we're at loggerheads all the time it's it's like the Hatfields and McCoys you know the the drill baby drill people and the renewable energy people and the problem is we don't have an energy policy that to me is is very sensible which is we need to have uh, we need to have an energy policy that's a comprehensive policy that has a plan for how we're going to have energy conservation now, development of renewables, a transition fuel like, like natural gas, if we can do it in a, in a safe and environmental way, and then ultimately transitioning. And he goes, yeah. And so we agreed, yeah, I know, we agreed, we were standing right there on the baseball field wearing these ridiculous outfits, and I said, and I said so why don't we do a bill to have a, um, bi to have a bipartisan commission, bipartisan, bicameral, and the White House have a commission to develop a national energy plan, so we're introducing the bill next week. So let's hope that it works. Yeah, I know. Wow. See? You know, I will I will stop at nothing to try to have some kind of bipartisan <laughs> result. Obviously, <laughs> although I, I'm glad I didn't have to throw that baseball out. That's all. Right. But I would even do that if I could pass a bill. What were you wearing again? You were I, I was wearing this this very large Washington Nationals shirt over my regular clothes. It was a stylish look. I'm sure there's a website somewhere. Oh, I hope. I so. But I did wear my Colorado Rockies earrings just to show my true allegiance. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so a few questions here about Safe Drinking Water Act and Clean Air Act and related acts. Uh, here we go. Uh, why should fracking be subject to the same underground injection control regulations when hydraulic fracturing is a short-term injection process followed by a long-term production of the well, which causes the fluid to be covered by the well. Regulation for long-term injection wells should not be the rules applied to short-term injection of hydraulic fracturing of oil and gas wells. Wouldn't you agree? 
Well, here's the here's the way hydraulic fracturing works. And and if you haven't have have, have you taken a field trip out to frac sites? I have yeah, been granted. Yeah. To. Okay. So 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 here's what happens is is the is is um, uh, the fluid is injected into the into the um, well, and it's it's very viscous when it goes in because of the chemical components, and then it spreads out and then it expands, and then additional components are um, chemicals are injected in the well, and they remove the viscous nature of the frac fluid, and then it's all sucked back up. The fluid is sucked back up, and then the natural gas is released. So while it may be, it, so, so uh, the, the, the companies will tell you that it's, it goes, as you've seen in the TV ads, deep below, right, right deep <laughs> below the groundwater. But the pro there's a couple of problems. The first problem is if the casing is improperly installed, then the frac fluid can leak out into the aquifers. The second issue is in some place, in some places, not Colorado so much, but in other places, the the um, the, the, the deposits are different and they're closer to the groundwater. And the third problem is when you bring the fluid back up and you put it in the case in the ponds, then it can leach out into the groundwater. So there are a number of ways that this the, that this frac fluid can leak into the groundwater. Even if it's a short-term drilling, the groundwater can still come back. There are some some um, new techniques that people are using where where it's um where they don't bring the water up and hold it in ponds. But that's being used in a very, very small percentage of the wells that are being drilled. Okay, and this actually, there's a whole little stack here of ones involving the question you've taken up here. And one of them is open frac fluid storage pits. And we do include all questions, so this may repeat things that you've already said, but uh, you can cut me off if that's the case. Does frac that deal with regulation of open pit frac yes. fluid storage pits? Will they these still be allowed in states even with increase in, uh, in this state, even with increase in flooding and health risks associated with contamination? Well, well, under the FRAC Act, um, as I said, the FRAC Act basically subjects the, um, the, the, the oil and gas companies and fracking to the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. The Safe Drinking Water Act basically establishes um, uh, national standards for safe drinking water. It do, as I mentioned in my speech, it does not uh, drill drill down. <laughs> that was clever. It, it, it doesn't go. It doesn't go deeply into the um, specifications of each well. That's really up to the regulators in the states who are administering the Safe Drinking Water Act. So in a state, they may determine that these open storage ponds are. Uh, uh, they, that people can do them and with certain uh, with certain linings or certain other um, requirements that they can safely store this frac fluid or they may determine that it's not that they can't meet those minimum environmental standards if they do that so that would really be an issue that would be up to the states not to the EPA okay and I'm staying on water contamination for a couple more questions here this is I'm, actually I'm going to go through three of these because they so converge can you speak to why none of the suspected cases of water contamination can be proven with a link to fracking? What tools are lacking in order to achieve this? Uh, the EPA administrator, Colorado's governor, and many others, not just industry, have stated hydraulic fracturing has not caused groundwater contamination. Is that statement accurate? Well, it, I, I mean, it, as, as I said, uh, without, without a lot of substantive studies, and without any kind of disclosure requirement up until very recently in some states, it's difficult to see what kind of contamination we have, which is why we need to, uh, why we need to have the FRAC Act, so, and why we need to have these studies completed by the EPA. There have been some studies, um, as I sort of alluded to in, in my statement, there are some studies that have shown contamination, the industry, um, the industry objects to the methodology of those studies. There have been other studies that have shown uh, minimal contamination, but as I said, 
because, because for example, in Colorado, we have 50,000 wells. And so because this is so widespread, and it's in so many states with so many different formations, geologic formations, it's difficult to make a, a blanket statement. And that, that's why we need to get the information. But it, it's like I always say, and actually, many of the um, wells, yeah, many, many of the oil and gas companies are now coming around to the way of thinking that if they're going to claim that there's nothing harmful in this frac fluid, then, then they should be willing to disclose it because it looks that, like they're trying to hide something if, in fact, they say there's no harm, but they won't disclose it. And by the way, you might recall I mentioned diesel was supposedly banned under the original 2005 amendment. But um, a recent study that was done by my committee, the Democrats on my committee, a recent study showed that in fact, uh, many of these companies are using diesel in their frac fluid and not complying with the Safe Drinking Water Act. So we've had what I consider to be violations of even the minimal requirements that we have. Uh, actually, this gets to what you were just saying um, about disputed standards for proof. I've heard the legal standard for, pro for proving that a frac well caused damage to groundwater is virtually impossible to meet, and so judges are inclined to throw out such suits. Is that true? If so, what changes do you propose? I don't know the answer to that question, but we'll work on it. Okay. Uh, Clean Air Act uh, versus Safe Drinking Water Act. Please comment on regulation of the oil and gas industry via the Clean Air Act. Well, the, clean, the, the oil and gas industry is not exempt from the Clean Air Act, and so if there are violations on some of these sites, then, then the EPA would, and their state um, allies would have the ability to enforce the Clean Air Act. If there's, uh, um, if there's uh, and I, I think that's something that should be studied. Okay, here are two um, folks who've come up with an interesting comparison on cell phone uh, cell towers. So is the fracking exemption from the EPA similar to the telecom exemption from health effects related to siting and operation of radiation from cell phone towers and then uh, similar like cell towers, state highway projects, so shouldn't all, not just those on federal lands or minerals, be regulated under NEPA due to nexus with air quality. Air's no, air knows no boundaries. So we have our cell phone thing there, but this, this one of, oh boy, okay, so uh, NEPA should have jurisdiction, both of these are asserting that, yeah. and, and is it a similar situation of exemption for telecom for cell phone towers? Is there an exemption for EPA? You have a tough That's time. beyond that my, tough, yeah. my skill level. Okay. Well, we'll find someone who might know the answer to that, okay. but I don't. Uh, now, uh, in terms of the health issues and first responders and so on, I have uh, three with that. What does OSHA require for disclosure to medical responders? Nothing. Nothing. OSHA doesn't oh. have re requirements of disclosure. That's why we need disclosure under the community right to know statutes. The Safe Drinking Water Act does not cover skin exposure to chemicals. Why do you use the example of the Durango woman exposed to fracking fluid as justification to repeal the Halliburton exemption? Don't you have examples of actual drinking water contamination? Well. I'm using that example as someone who says they were harmed by chemicals in the, in, in the fracking fluid, but we don't know what's in the fracking fluid. So uh, there are studies that have happened both ways, but that was, that was something that sort of, uh, the, the, and, and P.S., that's why we have the second part of my bill, which is under the community right to know statute. So it's not just the, for the drinking water, but it's also the chemicals for if these, yeah, if these, if these workers are injured in some other way. I have heard that doctors who discover their patients have traces of fracking related chemicals in their system are not allowed to disclose this to their patients. Do you know if this is true? If so, is this a state law? Is anything being done to change this? I haven't, I haven't heard of this. No, I haven't heard of this, so I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. I, don't, I don't know how doctors would be able to determine whether it was from fracking fluid or not. Cause it's that yeah. same chicken and egg problem I keep talking about. Okay. Um, I think this refers, we might need a clarification from the writer, to the EPA, the money for EPA to do a major investigation on on, uh, well, as the leading 
voice on major investigations, including examining the potential health and safety threats of hydraulic fracturing. What is the strategy, status, and future of that investigation? Uh, I'm not in charge just now in Congress. You might have noticed that. Um, I'm the senior Democrat on the House um, Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce. And what that subcommittee is, that's the subcommittee that has oversight over investigations on the EPA. If I were the chairman, I like to say I'm the chairman in waiting of that subcommittee. But because I'm in the minority, I don't get to set the agenda, although I have many productive conversations with my chairman, who I have a, actually do have a very good relationship with, and who actually is from Pennsylvania. Tim Murphy is his name. And so I, um, I, I've been actually trying to persuade him to have a series of investigations on fracking. I think his constituents from Pennsylvania would be very interested in those hearings, but so far I have been unsuccessful in my request. If I do become chairman of that subcommittee after the next election, um, I think that would be a really great, wouldn't that be great to have some, some actual hearings, so I'm working on it. Okay, um, now we're a little on property issues. Uh, how do you see the legal challenge between the surface rights owners who want to regulate access in residential areas versus mineral owners, and this is written by a person who graduated from Colorado College. Of course, the Colorado College Tiger. Um, so, so uh, I, 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 one of the things that has happened, and I've, I've talked to a lot of property owners, is because of the expanded places where we can do hydraulic fracturing, Many property owners did not realize when they purchased their property that they signed their mineral rights away. And that's a contractual issue. Um, and, so, and so I think that th there's a lot of litigation around folks, uh, around those issues. But I think ultimately where the courts are going to come down is what was the contract and, and you know, we're, did the person knowingly sell their mineral rights or convey them in some other way. I think that's the way those issues are going to turn out. I think one reason why we've had had um, a lot of legal, um, we've had a lot of lawsuits around that, and we've had a lot of confusion on the part of landowners, is because we have many landowners who signed away their mineral rights but had no idea that they had done that because we never had oil and gas development on those properties. Um. I'm going now to renewables in relationship with renewables. I believe we need to shift the energy paradigm uh, away from fossil fuels to renewables. What is being done at the federal level to ensure this transition for the sake of future generations? The science says we cannot wait. I, well, I, I mean, I agree. P part of, if, if you look at um, the, the whole issue of climate change and if you look at, at, at our energy future, we have to look at renewables. And one of my great concerns has been, and it, it's why I, I really went across the aisle and approached my colleague about trying to do some kind of an energy plan, is because, is because we, we, have to, we, we have to develop renewable energy in a way, and, and there's a whole host of issues. Of course, there's the issue of um, the technologies, there's the issue of the um, economics of it, there's the issue of the grid. Um, you know, ma many places where we can produce renewable energy, we don't have the grid to be able to transmit that. And so, so there's a lot of issues that we need to work on, and we need to, and we need to do it pronto. But uh, unfortunately, what tends to happen in Congress, and this is not a Democrat versus Republican issue, a lot of it is regional. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, for example, I sit next to a, a good friend of mine who I work with on a lot of issues, Gene Green. He's from Houston, Texas. And so he, he's representing his constituents and his economy when he votes for more tax relief and so on for um, the oil and gas industry. I, I feel like I'm on the side of truth, justice, and the American way when I vote for uh, tax support and so on for renewable energy. But a lot of this is, is, um, it is, is local. I was the chief, one of my other roles in Congress is I'm chief deputy whip for the Democrats. And so my job is counting votes. That's, that's what I do. I, I try to count votes to pass bills. And one of the most challenging whip um, 
web operations I ever had was when, when the Democrats were in the majority and we passed the Renewable Energy Standard. Do you remember that? When we actually passed, passed the Renewable Energy Standard and we were able to do that with Democrats and Republicans. Another less successful um, whipping effort, well, it was successful on my part, but as I say, it then went over to the Senate where, as we, we like to say, not so much these days, where we say, you know, the place where all good bills go to die. But we, we passed the uh, Waxman-Markey bill in the, in the House, which was the cap and trade bill, a very important climate change bill. And I was the person who shepherded that in, under very difficult circumstances through the Energy and Commerce Committee because the Republicans didn't send a team out onto the field. So we had to pass that completely with Democratic votes. And we have a lot of oil and gas uh, Democrats, as I mentioned, on that committee. We got it through the, the committee, and then uh, we got it through the House by the skin of our teeth, only to have it, only to have it die in the Senate. So it's, it's been a frustrating and long process, but a lot of us continue to work really hard on this every day. Because, because whoever asked that question is right. Ultimately, we have to move to, to renewable energy. You mentioned that we now have a segue to more reliable energy and renewables. How do you feel about taxing hydrocarbons to pay for possible future costs associated with CO2 emissions, especially with the benefits derived from the new energy economy? New energy well, boom? I mean, that's what I was just talking about with the cap and trade bill, but, but unfortunately, I don't really see any interest in the current leadership in the House to fix that. And, and frankly, you know, people say, what can we do about this? And what I say is, we just have to win an election. That's what we have to do. I mean, seriously, I, I'm not going to change their minds. Um, with regard to natural gas as a bridge fuel to renewables, with the advantage over coal, no national scientific body has been given the charge to determine methane leakage or enforceable yes. standards. What can be done? Yes, um, that's another issue that we really need to look into because the methane issue is, how, how many of you have seen gas land? Um, you know, when they're lighting their faucets on fire, that's methane, most of it. So, so we have to, did you see me in gas land? I, I, I'm at the oh, very right end. Yeah, grilling some witnesses, one of the highlights. But that of is often biogenic methane. That yes. is often just... Right. Right, okay, so methane, okay. Um, several that I wasn't quite able to place in my category had gone by by the time they get it. Yeah, do you support equal protection under the federal trade secret, federal, excuse me, federal trade secrets law for proprietary chemicals and fracking? Uh, in, in my bill, I, I put protections in for proprietary information, and I think that's the statute that it should be in. Have you personally visited Frat Focus and the mapping function? And do you realize that Frat Focus is sponsored by the Department of Energy and a joint venture with GWPC and IOGCC? Well, yes, I have visited Frat Focus. You still, if you want the chemical components, you still have to go well by well. And, um, and I don't know about the partnerships. Um, I, I know it's an industry registry, which is not, but if it's, I mean, it's not. You, if it is, well, it, who knows if it is sponsored I, by DOE. But, but I, I will say, I'm not opposed to frac focus. I think it's a good tool. I just think it, 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 I think we need, number one, we need to have mandatory disclosure which we do not have in all states. We only have it in a couple states. And number two, we need to have a neutral website that, 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 that's user friendly. We, need, we might need a question form over there. So, uh, no, actually, uh, if you could just write it. I'm sorry. Sorry? It's mandatory in 14 states. Right, so it's not mandatory okay. in the rest. Oh, okay, thank you yeah. for that. Pavilion. Uh, has a grand total of two monitoring wells installed. Why not require groundwater monitoring wells and or at all oil and gas sites and a yearly monitoring? So the pavilion, uh, pavilion has two monitoring wells, a grand total of two monitoring wells installed. Why not require groundwater monitoring wells at all oil and gas sites and a yearly monitoring? of? Well, I, again, I, I think that States are going to have to determine 
I mean, if the FRAC Act passes, I think states will have to determine what the best way to comply with that is, whether it's, whether it's testing at every site or some other method. That's really what the state regulators are going to have to decide. Um, what about the issue of fracking causing earthquakes? Yeah, you know, we've, we've heard about that, and there was some anecdotal evidence of fracking causing earthquakes in, in Wyoming. This is something that the EPA is looking at in its expanded fracking studies. Um, of course, the industry uh, argues about the methodology and the, and the data from, from that anecdotal evidence in Wyoming. And frankly, I don't think we can base our public policy just based on on, on one experience, although others have now told me uh, from other states that they have seen um, seismic activity as well. So I think that's something that should be studied to see if that's happening. Could the U.S. liquid natural gas export plans be curtailed if there are environmental problems with fracking? Well, if there's environmental problems with fracking, then, then that's going to affect the whole production, I think. of I mean, if, if these laws go into effect and if fracking can't be done in an environmentally sound way, then that'll naturally affect the liquid gas um, exports Okay, because we'll have less natural gas. Uh, the, I'm following up a little bit on that. Is the industry's concern that if the frac act passes and the fluid um, and frac fluid information becomes public domain, the public will overwhelmingly decide against fracking? If that happens, has there been an, uh, an assessment of the economic implications of that occurring? Well, I, you know, in fairness to the industry, I don't really think that's their concern. I think what their concern is over-regulation by the EPA. And that, that is based in part on, in my opinion, on a lack of understanding of how the Safe Drinking Water Act um, is administered, since for the most part it's administered by the states. Um, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot of concern about the EPA. And I hear people, and, and, and in addition, I think that the industry really got used to very little regulation for some number of years. The, the Halliburton exemption is just, just the last example of that. And that's why I've tried to work with the industry to really say, you know, it is not my intention that the EPA would be the agent that, that you'd have to apply to Washington for, for your well siting or your, or your controls or your reporting or so on. Um, it, it, it really is administered by the states. And it, but what it does is it sets a minimum standard, and I think everybody agrees. Uh, the reason we passed statutes like the Safe Drinking Water Act, which had widespread Republican support back low so many decades ago when it was passed, is because everybody can agree that one of the standards we should have in this country is safe drinking water for our children. Are you aware of the work of Deborah Rogers on the global macroeconomics of fracking and the investment banker-led uh, oil and gas bubble? If so, your views? No, I'm not, but if you send me the information, okay. I will read it. Details at energypolicyforum.org. Perfect. Write um, that down. If not, energypolicyforum.org. Suggest you call her to testify in Washington when you get your hearing. Well, I'm not in here. charge yet. I know that. I remember <laughs> that part. Uh, and here's a question I think you won't answer. There's a guess as to the name of the whistleblower from EPA who was working, and I think that's probably, as I understand, whistleblower. Well, his, his name is not a secret. Um, is that right? No, West, West, yeah. West Wilson. Okay. Yeah, West Wilson. Yeah. Whistleblowers just, they don't get witness protection? Okay. Well, so, no, West okay. didn't. So, well, you know. well, West doesn't work for the EPA anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess you wouldn't need yeah. witness protection then. So, um, okay, so here's just a few questions West going is, back West to. West was in Gasland too, I think. Oh, yeah. That is. Yeah. Um, All righty. So now we're going to back to some issues about. Uh, levels of jurisdiction that came in after we talked about that before. What path do you think can reconcile the conflict between private property mineral rights and cities' home rural authority to regulate land use and through that prohibit fracking? Well, I don't, I don't think those two things are, 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 are mutually exclusive because um, if, a, if, if a city wanted to regulate, I don't, I don't know, strip mining in, in that city, even if somebody had uh, even if so, it, even if somebody owned the mineral rights, uh, the city could could regulate that. 
uh, with an EPA national fracking standard, what would happen to municipalities that wanted to prevent fracking in their localities? Would local prevention, prevention be prescribed? No, because um, really, really the Safe Drinking Water Act is a floor, not a ceiling. So if, if uh, state or local governments wanted to put additional um, protections in place, they could do that. It's, it's really a minimum standard. Can you comment on the voluntary local government designee LGD program offered by the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission? No, I can't. Or can I? So I'm federal, try to but I that. can <laughs> check it out if you want me to. Uh, uh, I should worry about that. Uh, what is the current status of the lawsuits against fracking in Colorado? I don't know. The Supreme Court will be ruling on the Longmont okay. issue soon. But. Uh, okay, then a, a couple of statements at the last year about sources and publications and getting information, the scientific information uh, that would be a good basis for decision making. In order to get accurate scientific information, numerous studies need to be done. Yes. How are you going to eliminate publication bias and studies not performed by your initiatives? Well, I mean, uh, number one, the, the EPA is conducting an independent scientific analysis and, and, those, and, and also um, the GAO. The, these are independent scientific studies. The studies I mentioned that the EPA did before the 2005 Act were surveys of the literature. They weren't independent studies. So, so you know, if, if you use the scientific method, then then these will be independent studies. There are also additional groups that are doing scientific studies and evaluation on, on both sides, from the industry and also from the environmental community. So we're, we're going to be getting more and more data. And are you excited about our National Science Foundation project, which is doing? Yes. Yes, I thought you would be okay. <laughs> that was not anything a written question. Anything that's <laughs> ours. Yeah. OK. Uh, how can we improve incorporation of research into formulations of regulation and policy for oil and gas development? Well, I think, I think that's a really good question to end with because I think we could improve incorporation of science and research into all of our public hmm. policy. And, you know, I often make speeches where I tell people I, I'm really radical because I think that we should believe that we should rely on safe science, sound science when we legislate. And, and I think in fracking, there's no, better, there's no better example of where we really need to have sound science before we regulate. Because, because here we are, we're going off of beliefs and suppositions and incomplete, uh, incomplete knowledge on both sides and allegations. You know, one side saying that, oh, this is completely safe, here's my glass of fracking fluid and I'll drink it right down and then the other side is saying this is terrible it can never be made safe and it should be banned and 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 this is this, this is fracking is a, a, a um, oil and gas extraction technique that if it can be done safely and in an environmentally sound way could really help lead us to in, environmental or I mean to oil, to to um, energy independence into, and that leads us to national security because we're not so dependent on foreign oil. And it also helps us around the world. Last, last February, I was on a trip um, to Germany and um, our, our little group of, of nine members of Congress had this meeting with Chancellor Merkel. And Chancellor Merkel was asking that because, you know, they just banned nuclear energy in Germany just like they did it. And also, actually, Japan asked me the same thing. When are you guys sending us liquefied natural gas because we really want to buy it from you? So there are a lot of potential economic upsides of this if it's safe. But the downsides, and, and, and you know, we're, we're Coloradoans. And so we we see we see um, we we see we, we've had so many extractive industries in Colorado over the centuries, and we see the boom and bust economies. We see the environmental damage this can do. And so what we really need to make sure is if we're going to go down this path, we we can't go blindly down this path. We need to know what the environmental impacts are and how and if they can be minimized. So this is the perfect example of where we need sound science before we legislate because otherwise we're just going on impulse and 
and arguments. And, and I, I think that's unfair uh, to both sides. So, so that's really what I'm trying to achieve. And that now, you've is, got one well, late-breaking question. Well, I do. Okay. And I also had a little, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I think you were right there, just one step from this. Shouldn't we do the studies before we frack, not after? Yes. <laughs> oh. But, but you know we're fracking. We're fracking now. So what we have to do is, is you know, unfor unfortunately, if you would have asked me, I would have done. I, I would have never had the Halliburton loophole. I wouldn't have been doing this fracking without the without the Safe Drinking Water Act for for the last eight years. That that. But you know, here we are. So now we have to. Now we have to put the environmental controls in place. Okay, and I, I want to uh, say that the poor gentleman who I cut off, who actually had a very substantive thing to say, you get, when people come up afterwards, you get the first moment here because I was bad and squished you, so. Um, so, so uh, and I also just want very quickly just to say, as a historian, I remember when we studied the progressive era, and for all of the opposition between Theodore Roosevelt and industry and so on, there was a lot of backstory going on with a lot of industries saying to the uh, progressives, could you regulate us because we have lost public trust? And even though there might be denunciations in public, there was a real sense of regulation could, some of the industries, shipping industry, food and drug, I mean, all this, uh, there was something going on there. Are you nostalgic for that? Do you think that is coming again? Or? I'm too young to have nostalgia well, for that. But, well, but, too. but, 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 but um, what I do think is, is uh, I think the industry is now, uh, much, much of the oil and gas industry, not all of it, uh, but much of the oil and gas industry is now coming to understand and I, I told them, I, I meet with them all the time, and I say to them, you should really work with people like me who are trying to find that sweet spot, that balance between environmental regulation and development of natural gas. And, and uh, you should work with people like me because that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and a lot of people now are beginning to understand that. And as I mentioned, in 2010, um, we, we were at the negotiating table and we, we were about to have a solution and then when the election came then, then, then they walked. So now what they're seeing is they're seeing, uh, you know, we've got five elections tonight and we're seeing this across the country where local and, and county governments and state governments are beginning to try to regulate fracking oftentimes in ways that are far excessive than, than, um, than, than the Safe Drinking Water Act or the Community Right to Know Act or any of these acts would do. So they're beginning to start coming around to this thinking. Um, and I think, you know, and a, and a lot of people say, they have this understanding, look what's, look what's happening in China right now with air pollution is, you know, there was absolutely no environmental regulation. Or when I was a little girl growing up in Denver, in the wintertime, you could never see the mountains. And now, because of the Clean Air Act, of course, our air is much better, our kids' health is much better. So I think, you know, I think, I think sensible environmental regulation, it's not just for the left, it's for everybody. It's, it's for our kids. Great. Well, thank you so much.